Это объект, который хранится весь практически стратегический запас ядерных материалов с применением уже нормальных так сказать, средств нападения. И туда не санкционировано пройти это. Нужна крупная войсковая операция. Очень уютный городок. Жалко, что закрыт. City 40 is about uh, a closed nuclear city in Russia, uh, where actually they constructed it in uh, 1947 during the Soviet Union to um, create one, the Soviet Union's first nuclear program, and two, to produce and build the first plutonium-based bomb. So it, the, the significance of the city is because it's considered the birthplace of the Soviet Union's nuclear program. Right. And the significance of it today is because it still remains a closed city. Um, it is no longer a secret city because, you know, people, the Americans, even when it was secret, the Americans knew about the city, the Europeans knew about the city, and I'm talking about the governments and the secret uh, agencies. They knew about the city. Uh, however, today is no longer secret, uh, but still remains a forbidden city. Can you explain a little bit what that means? What exactly is a closed city? And tell us a little bit of the story of how this film came to be. How did you come to know about it and then start, you know, have the idea to actually make a movie? Um, Okay, so the, let me t just explain what a closed city is. A closed city, they actually stole the plan. The Soviets stole the plan. The first closed city was built in Washington State. It's called Richland. And it was built around the uh, uh, Hanford nuclear factory, which actually very recently they had a leak, a radioactive leak. And it's been reported now, uh, you know, in the news media, certain media in, in the States. So they, they, they and uh, that city, which was closed, meaning no one had access. It's like, an, um, you know, the closest thing would be a high security military base. However, the, the difference between that and a closed city is that, uh, for instance, in Russia, uh, you know, closed city of Ozersk, which is called today Ozersk City 40, nobody was allowed to leave or enter for eight years in the beginning. So the, the relatives of these people who were relocated to city, they considered them as missing. They just disappeared. Mm -hmm. And that was the end of it. And they, uh, But they, they created a paradise for these people, mm -hmm. so they didn't want to escape. They had everything they possibly needed and more. So uh, And then they were working to produce plutonium bombs. So these people who had absolutely nothing outside. They had everything and beyond, uh, like an episode of Twilight Zone or a science fiction yeah. film, right? They had everything, they, uh, but in, in uh, they also, the, the, and I'm talking about the Soviet Union at the time, they didn't, uh, they didn't put aside the idea that maybe there would be a nuclear accident that would actually erase these people. They would kill these people. So they actually, what they decided to do, they erased their identity, meaning they didn't exist out of outside of the city so in terms of today today they have a certain uh, the access to the outside world, but they have to get exit visas. So there's the, the population in the city still is about 100,000. It's, it's either they're the second or third generation of the population who actually have been uh, born and you know raised and live there. And they still, majority of the 100,000, about let's say 66, 67,000 still are working for the Mayak or related to the Mayak in one way or another. And they still continue to produce uh, component for nuclear weapons and Russian military. Mm -hmm. But the, the, the importance of the city at the same time is that it is where they store the, the largest stockpile of nuclear material uh, and reserve of uh, Russian nuclear material. So that is the highest, uh, they have the highest concentration of the stockpiles in that city. Can you tell us a little bit about how you came to be involved in this? Like, this is a really I'm Iranian. What else yeah. would I get yeah. involved in? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> don't don't, don't like, put yeah, that yeah, in. Yeah, I yeah, still want to go back to LA where I live. I have two kids, please. Yeah, no. no. Um, the reason I was actually interested is because I always start my films with a question. 
so I don't have a story. I'm not interested in any stories because then you have to follow a specific thing. And for me, the question was, after I, I had done the Bin Laden film, the media, the governments, they, they still up to this day, they talk about the threat of nuclear terrorism. So what I wanted to know, and then you have the mushroom clouds and da, 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 da. So I was thinking, is this really realistic? Do we really have to be afraid of this? So basically it was the deconstruction of the, um, uh, the fear industry. So I thought, okay, what is my question? Because I'm not getting the answer from the media, I'm not getting it from the governments or anything that I'm you know, looking into. So I thought, uh, if I were a terrorist, a non-state actor, and I'm not talking about the state, that's a completely different ball game. I'm talking about non-state individual. Would I be able to get my hands on enough nuclear material and technology? Because the material is not enough if you don't know how to put it together and make a bomb. So would I be able to actually do it and pose a real threat? And that was my question that started me onto the journey that I went and I didn't, I didn't have an answer. I didn't know. I did a year of research and I learned everything there was to learn about nuclear material, nuclear bombs and, uh, you know, where you go. And of course, every, and is there a nuclear black market and underground? So everything, of course, you know, leads you to Russia. And I knew that I cannot get into Russia and really make a film, whatever that film might have been. I had no idea where I was going, mm -hmm. you know, uh, with outside financing. Nobody would have talked to me. I would have been written off as a spy or a mouthpiece for a mouthpiece for another company uh, or a broadcaster or whatever it, it might have been. So and it was a risky uh, thing to do anyway. So I thought, I, you know, I just go by myself. And I just took my backpack. I went to Moscow. I met my fixer, you know, who you see in the film. And it was a, a, a question, a matter of convincing him to trust me that I, I'm not here for somebody else or for another reason. I'm not a spy. And uh, once he was convinced, then we started going into looking uh, for uh, the, the close city and, 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 and City 40, uh, which is, uh, you know, first we went to Siberia and then we went to the Oral Mountains mm -hmm. where this city is uh, located. And the question then when we got there, how do we get contact, make contact with the people inside? So every step was, we don't, we didn't, I didn't know. So how do you make those kind of decisions when you're crafting the story? Like you're searching, you want to do a nuclear type focus, you find yourself you know, near these restricted cities. How did the human story emerge out of that? Okay, that That's the, this was actually um, a, a process of learning and reflect, reflection for me as a person, not as a filmmaker, because we were, I, I came out with a lot of stuff. Right. And I was lucky to be able to get them out. And then once we once I arrived back, I had this material and I, I had to do a lot of reflection because what was important, I can sit here, I can make a film, I can write an essay or do a news piece and give you all the information. Right. All the data about what's happening, you know, if the, a bomb is dropped, da, 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 da. It's totally abstract to you. So. Then I had to rethink what is the concept of reality? What is reality here? Because those guys, reality is science fiction to us, right? So I thought, okay, reality basically is shared experience. That's reality. So you and I, we are sharing the same experience in the city of Toronto. It's called, we understand what that means. It's our reality. You tell that to somebody who's coming from LA and you say, bring a code. It's really cold here. It's abstract to them. They have no idea until they come here and they share that experience. They, that becomes also a reality for them. So for me, the question was when I was constructing the story, right, and, and the narrative, how do I, as a filmmaker and a storyteller, take that reality, which is abstract to my audience here, yeah. and turn it, take the abstract out of it and make it into a shared experience for the audience? And that led me to the concept of truth. What is truth? Truth without meaning has no, it, it falls flat on its face. Sure. So my uh, then next step was, how do I give meaning to these people's truth through taking the abstract out of uh, rea what is reality to these people on this side? So it was then, it became, uh, uh, how do I give that tr the, the truth that has meaning for them and has no meaning for you 
that you know a, 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 a reach it to you yeah how can we it how is can, so alien it is yeah, so alien yeah yeah how do i how do I, mm-hmm. so it and i realized actually the only way somebody else's truth becomes yours is when it goes from the heart to heart mm-hmm. uh, i see it's interesting because the film does kind of maintain this balance between the different perspectives of people living in the city. Can you talk just briefly about that? Like why? Because there's a faction of people who kind of like the city. Of and course. Like the they still loved it. Which Absolutely. Yeah, we were watching it, and like you said, from an outside source looking in, yeah. on not understanding that truth. It seemed insane. Yes. Right. So many people said, this is great. Look at all we have. This is our, our generation. So I, I think, I think we understand like why people would want the city to, you know, reduces restrictions but can you explain the kind of that truth that people are living that think that the right. city is a good thing right right the, the thing that uh, people who haven't seen the film this one of the things that's happening that there are different issues that we address in the film um, because it's a local story it seems but it has global significance it has global implications and one is because it is uh, uh, one of the most contaminated pl- places on the planet since the beginning when they started producing pl- uh, plutonium and uh, highly enriched uranium, they were dumping the radioactive substance into the earth, into the environment. So it has become one, one of the lakes. It's called a plutonium lake, you know, because they had dumped so many, death so much. Lake, I think yeah, and they call it yeah. Lake of Death, yeah. right? And um, so, but some of that stuff ended up in the Arctic Ocean. And then there was uh, a major, major accident. The, one of the biggest nuclear accidents before Chernobyl, uh, that they kept it as a secret. Nobody knew until after Chernobyl happened. And then in 1967, they had another one. So this is a ticking bomb in terms of an in, a global environmental disaster, in terms of it could, there could be any day a huge accident because of the amount, the huge mm-hmm. amount of radioactive material. It's away from the city. It's inside the city, it's inside the factory, it's a nuclear complex. You know, it's not just one factory, it's a complex. So it has uh, environmental implications, global in, uh, environmental compli- uh, implication. It has security implications. It has human rights implications and all that. that. So, so why these people still love the city? Um, the fact is that, and they died. Like the, yeah. the 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 rate of cancer in that city is one of the highest anywhere, and they they go through a lot of painful diseases. I mean, some of the and the kids, some the of children, the, yeah. the, the the kids, like they were. Uh, uh, jumping into a lake that is contaminated and they're eating food that's contaminated but and, and, and I didn't want to judge them because that's the thing that they nobody will talk to you if you start judging them but one of the things that I understood was this is the only place that they have ever known they don't know anything else, and the the bar, and you know, when you talk to them about maybe ninety percent, and the, 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 when the guy was talking about that, nobody wants the barbed wire fences to come down, and it's wow. double barbed wire fence, right? He was actually he wasn't exaggerating. So if you talk to people, about ninety percent would do, they don't want the barbed wire fence to come down, and I tell you the reason that was my interpretation of it is because one is the security. They have been told since the very beginning, you are the nuclear shield of the world. World. You are the saviors of the world. You are the elite. You're the chosen ones. So they have internalized that for two, three generations, and they really, truly believe that. So it's the barbed wire fences. If you look at it philosophically and in a political sense, we think of the barbed wire fence to keep yeah. people out, yeah, right. right, or in. That's the question. Is the barbed wire fence for these people to keep people out or to keep pe- 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 people in? For them, is to keep people out. The f- and, and by that, they don't mean just the foreigners. They mean even the people who live outside of the city, the Russians who are non-resident, who are not allowed to walk in. You know, it's, it's, it's forbidden. So for them, it's a sense of being protected. And and outside, it's you know, it's not. Somebody was talking about it's like uh, the Stockholm syndrome. Mm-hmm. It is not. It's a completely different concept because in the uh, Stockholm syndrome, people who were taken as hostages or prisoners, they had an identity before they were taken a hostage or a prisoner. Right? These people had have no identity outside of the city, so they will be completely lost. They would be scared. They would think that, and they have been told that everybody on the outside is an enemy that was interesting in the movie where people actually 
identified, like their identity was so closely tied to the city that they were living in. Yes, and that's, that's, that's really their identity. That's that. the mother. And at, at the, the, the final analysis is that City 40 is really the microcosm of Russia today. Uh, can you, before we get to the other questions, just speak to that? Like, how does it relate? Like, you mentioned uh, sorry, environmental concerns and whatnot, but how does it relate to Russia as a whole and maybe some other global societies? Okay, well, how does it, to me, uh, when I was taught, because if you look at what these people believe, right? First of all, Russia, people can travel outside, right? right. But the Russians relate to their country as the motherland. So like this, the people in the city 40, uh, this is, they are doing everything because this, they're doing it for the city. They're the chosen ones. This is the motherland. Everybody on the outside is an enemy. This is the mentality. You do not talk to anybody about Russia. You do not talk about to anybody about city 40 because then you are um, accused of being a traitor. So if you see on the international scale, the Russians who have left the country and have talked about the motherland, they ended up being fatally poisoned by radioactive uh, polonium 210 or, you know, hit in the head and dead, well, they, you know, they found them dead in a hotel room in Washington, D.C. So in that way, people from inside the Russia, they still have that paranoid mentality of the Soviets that the people from outside, they are the enemy. They want to destroy right. this great country that we have. And even though we, we have problems, even though we're dying, and even though there is not so much, but it is for the better of the motherland. Mm -hmm. You talked about the idea that you needed to connect heart to heart yes. with your audience in order for them to really appreciate what this is like. It's so sci-fi for someone right. like us. What do you hope that connection would yield for your subjects? Because looking in at it after we watch the film, there's this feeling that you just you want to help. Like you said, you don't you want to try to break out of that idea that national identity is something to die for. You know, these you, you want to help them in that way. From your perspective as a filmmaker, what do you hope this analysis of uh, this issue kind of yields? Do you hope that that's diminished or are you just coming in as an observer? What I'm hoping for is that uh, through the, you know, I, I, I decided to construct the story, the narrative, uh, you know, uh, from the personal. So it's a personal story of these people, right? Because usually you don't hear the Russians really speak to yeah. the outside world. It, they either have been presented or represented as victims or mafia, basically, right? So we don't really hear their voices. So for the first time, we hear their voices uh, from inside the city. And I want wanted to create a sense of identity, identification. So the audience identified with a mother who is, you know, with their kid yeah. on a stroller and he, she's sick or he's sick. So we, 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 I wanted to create that sense of identification so that we go, you know, we, whatever they're saying, it, it, it doesn't go through any channels or any whatever filters. It goes from their heart to our hearts. And that's when we understand what's happening. And through that identification, what I was hoping for, not to, not that we judge them in any way, not to, because that would, I have failed if actually that would be the case. I was, ho and I'm hoping that we have a sense of empathy, empathy for somebody else's reality, and that is no longer abstract, that there are people on the other side, that is not uh, their issues and their problems and the risks that they are facing and their pain also is not only in their backyard, but it will and it has ended up in our side of the world. But also in the big on the, for the big the, the big picture for me, I make films because I really truly believe film in itself is not an end in itself. It's a tool, a tool that we have, and it is most effective when we use it uh, to create a, a, a space, space, a, a political space, or, or um, uh, any kind of space that you, you want it to be, to have the audience actually to engage and, and uh, you know, reflect, and then start thinking for themselves. So the, I, I hope with this film, the audience, instead of listening, 
and believing everything that is being thrown at them, whether it's the media, whether it's the governments or whatever, or threats of this or that, they really have resources all over the place, like this film, to really look and you know engage and make up their own mind and start really thinking critically. Well, I think it does achieve that, that, that critical look. Thank you so much Thank for you. joining our program. City 40, a critical analysis of the secret forbidden city in Russia, and like you said, the human story that yes. affects yeah. all of us. So thank you so much for taking the time. Really thank you so that. much. Thank you. Thank you. Мы так привыкли, мы так и будем жить. Может быть хуже, может быть лучше, еще неизвестно. А вот сейчас как есть, оставьте меня, не трогайте, пожалуйста. Моя мама рассказывала мне, что, ну, государственная тайна есть, она пусть будет. This is really a nightmare.